If I could switch jobs with any other JC's professional, first of all, I would not. Wow, that is a really tough question. I don't know if I have an answer to that question. Is that okay? That's that's a hard one. Um, I don't know if I would switch. That's kind of a hard one because I love my position here and I love what I do. Uh, maybe locations, uh, somewhere sunny with the beach. I would probably do a lateral move to somebody else that's a database administrator somewhere closer to the beach. I would probably switch jobs with my counterpart in San Diego, the program director of the San Diego JCC. Welcoming people and taking them on tours of the JCC and inviting them into the community. I would like to be... Um, um, the best official tour guide of the JCC movement. I was about to say the CEO, that I would switch jobs with the CEO just to see what it was like for the day. But I would switch with Paul, who is the CEO of our building. I would want to be uh, in charge and I would want to be under the pressure of running the building. I would like a day in the life of my boss, um, the executive director, Eric Lightman. Probably a chief operation officer because I love to communicate with different departments, see how they tick, and try to work together. I would maybe want to be a camp director, maybe just for a day or a week. I think it would be somebody at camp. Probably I would gravitate toward camp. We're switching jobs every single day. It's not a professional job, but we become big brothers, big sisters, moms, aunts, granddaughters. So I feel that the JCC movement actually is a movement because everything moves every single day. Well, I love my job as a shaliach. I get to experience Everything from from you know business side of things to the creative side of things or working with people mostly, so I wouldn't trade it for the world. The person that organizes all the entertainment for the next in-person ProCon. Because I think it's gonna be a party and I wanna I wanna be part of planning that party. Welcome to the closing JCC Movement Moment, Power in Community. Please help us welcome two esteemed JCC professionals who will lead our roundtable discussion on collaboration, strengthening the JCC Movement. Deva Shub, CEO at the Edlovich JCC in Washington, D.C., a role she bravely assumed mid-pandemic. Deva is a veteran JCC leader and former Chief Program Officer at the Marlene Meyerson JCC Manhattan, where she launched Camp Satoga and opened the doors of JCC Harlem and Zach Bodner, CEO of the Oshman Family JCC, Palo Alto, California, and another veteran JCC leader. Zach is founder of the annual Z3 Project, a global effort to reimagine diaspora Israel relations, and author of Why Do Jewish? A Manifesto for 21st Century Jewish Peoplehood. Please welcome Deva and Zach. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Zach Bodner. And I'm Deva Shu. Welcome to ProCon 2021 closing JCC movement moment. Before we launch into our closing plenary, I'd just love to take a quick moment to thank all of our colleagues at JCC Association of North America. I cannot even begin to imagine all the work, details large and small, that went into planning an online conference for 3,000 plus of our colleagues. Huge mazel tov, thank you. Our closing plenary theme is power in community. We wanna talk about the benefits of leaning into collaboration and partnership and continuing to imagine how together, done well, we can accomplish so much more. We really can, Dave. I mean, look, one of the lessons we learned during COVID is that we're all interlinked, right? Whether whether we like it or, or not, we're, we're connected to each other. If something happens halfway around the globe, as we've now seen quite clearly, it really does affect every single one of us. But it's how we respond to a challenge together with our communities. That's what sets JCCs apart. You're totally right. During COVID, I think that we learn that we have incredible impact by levering our connections to one another. Uh, we've had to reassess what our assets are, um, what our liabilities are, and what our mission really is. And by doing this, leaning on each other, I think we've seen that folks have been able to let down some of their, their barriers or their boundaries that in prior iterations may have gotten in the way of playing together. And I think that we've seen that we can leverage our audiences, our impact and our resources by doing so much more together. And actually, I hope that these interdependent relationships end up being some of our COVID keepers that we look back on fondly from this crazy year, where I think there's not as much that we're gonna hold on to, but, but I think the idea that we can work together and do more is one that I know I'm taking with me into next year and beyond. Yeah, I am too. And I know you have some good stories about that this year, Deva. One of the ones that surfaced for us this year was um, in the early moments of the vaccine rollout in DC, Maryland, and Virginia, 
I was just seeing how painful it was for older adults to log on, try to get a vaccine appointment and not be able to, whether it was that they weren't that tech savvy or didn't have the time. Uh, it just seemed like we could be of help somehow. But we had just done all of these furloughs and layoffs like many of us have done around the country. And I knew that we weren't ready to take on a new big project by ourselves. So on a whim, I reached out to the director of our local Hillel, big shout out to Adina Kirstein from GW, and said, what if we tried to build something together? And overnight, literally, we leveraged our network to get the word out to older adults and her network to get the word out to current college students and alumni. And between the two of us, we recruited well over a thousand older adults who wanted help to be enrolled for the vaccine and over 400 students and alumni who were ready to be of service. And when I saw the results, it was so clear to me, that this was the kind of project we never could have done this well on our own. And just to, to, to amplify why this partnership mattered, not only did it get vaccines into arms quickly, but it was really um, something that the, the Jewish and the secular press responded to so powerfully. There were tons of articles and lots of coverage and our donors were really proud of this. So to me, it feels like the kind of thing where not only did we accomplish something in that moment, but hopefully we've built a strong foundation to work together in future years. That's awesome. I love that story. We have a similar story here, which I'll share very quickly before we jump into our panel, David. But here in Palo Alto, for the past six years, we've been running this very successful annual conference called Zionism 3.0, which has awesome. brought over a thousand people to RJ to discuss Israel and Israel diaspora issues. But obviously, this past year, we couldn't do it in person because of COVID, so we had to go virtual. Uh, but we didn't quite have all the know-how that we needed, the, all the tools, the ability to do. We, we just have we have incredible in-house talent, but we just we needed a little bit more. So we collaborated, we partnered, we reached out. We started with Andrew Levy and the Schwartz Reisman Center and the Prosserman JCC in Toronto, and we utilized their virtual J platform for the technology, which was amazing. Mm -hmm. And then we partnered with uh, Seventy Faces Media to help us get the word out and, and secure talent. We partnered with Open Door Media, who helped us produce our content. We produce, just dozens of organizations, institutions, awesome. and foundations, they, they all came together. But of course, as you know, David, like one of our best uh, partners is, is the JCC Association. Like JCC Association, JCC Global, they really came together and helped us make this a global experience. So in the end, we had over 30 JCCs from around the world that, that really participated in partnering in this project. And I'm not just talking about like they slapped their logo on it and they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll send out an email and tell our people about it. I mean, they really engaged so that people in every single one of these communities was involved. So that uh, the week of the event, we had over 5,000 people log on to the conference during the actual week of programming. And, and since then with our evergreen content, we've had over 70,000 views. So this is an example of how partnership can really make one plus one equal three or more. And you gave them a huge win. That's what's awesome. I mean, obviously you got something out of it. You were able to amplify your audience and extend your reach, but clearly there was something in it for all of those organizations that during a moment of COVID, thinking about our JCCs, we couldn't always be producing that kind of high level content uh, with this kind of staff reductions many of us had. And so if we could plug into what you were doing, we could serve our communities better. And next year when it's back in person, I'm absolutely gonna be there. Um, but I think that's part of the magic of partnerships is knowing who you are, what you're good at, what your gaps are and figuring out who you want to bring to the table because they bring something new and unique in that moment and there's a shared purpose. So um, I think that's awesome. Everybody wins. But enough about us. Um, let's open the conversation to four awesome, thoughtful, inspiring leaders who voices and endeavors represent the true essence of the Jewish community, uh, whose partnerships with the JCC movement demonstrate interconnected facets of JCCs, synagogues, and philanthropy and federations. Here they all come. I'm so delighted to have their voices at our virtual table. This is amazing. Uh, really, we are eager to dive in and talk about the power of partnerships. So let's get started. Welcome to our virtual round table. Welcome, First, everybody. Uh, let me do a welcome to Winnie Sandler Grinspoon, the president of the Harold Grinspoon Foundation, the organization that Create, creates leaders behind three programs that touch JCCs every day. PJ Library, we all know and love those books when they arrive in our home or our JCCs. J Camp 180 and Life and Legacy, such important programs. Winnie's leadership of the foundation has enriched all of our communities through these incredible programs and the foundation's very generous philanthropy. Welcome, Winnie. Thank you. Next, we have Rabbi Rick Jacobs. It's great to see you again, Rick. I uh, wish we were in person, but this is the next best thing. 
Uh, for those of you who don't know, Rick is the president of the Union for Reform Judaism, the URJ. He leads an enormous and diversely connected Jewish community, which just over a year ago joined with the JCC Association to launch an unprecedented collaboration to transform the field of Jewish early childhood education. Rick, I love spending time with you and welcome here today. Thank you. Great to be with you. And now we have Eric Fingerhut, president and CEO um, of, of JFNA. Um, 146 local Jewish federations are under that umbrella, of which over 40 are integrated JCCs. Prior to um, his appointment at JFNA, he was the president and CEO of Hillel International right here in Washington, D.C., where I am located. Uh, JFNA has been a partner to JCC Association and a convener of the heads of major Jewish organizations since the very start of the pandemic, leading support and leadership at a critical time. I hear about those phone calls, and it just seems like um, it's really been a lifesaver for, for so many in leadership roles. So thank you so much for, for your, 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 your part in the community during this crazy time. And finally, the other guy with the big white beard on the call to Daron Krakow, uh, president and CEO of the JCC Association of North America. Daron, you've really helped galvanize the way our communities just connect with each other. Your leadership has been phenomenal. Your dedication to the relationship building and collaboration in our extended communities has really uh, led the way by example. So welcome here, Daron, to your own conference. It's funny to be welcoming you here, but uh, thanks so much for being here. Thanks, Zach. So let's dive in. Um, we are eager to, eager to talk about the power of partnership. So let's get started. Each one of you is responsible for an organization with national scope. You work with constituents and beneficiaries all over the country. Let me start with a question for Winnie. Can you talk a little bit about how you identify opportunities for local partnerships, wherein each community is so different and unique, each having their own challenges and needs? So how do you, how do you consider um, who to play with and, and how to work those magical relationships so that everybody wins, like the example Zach and I were talking about earlier. Well, David, in some ways it's easy. We come up with ideas or programs that are really universal. So for example, in the PGA library world, we haven't met a community that isn't thinking about how they bring in and engage the next generation. So. So what it looks like on the ground in any particular community might differ, depend on the organization's existence, who does programming, who does fundraising, et cetera, et cetera. But, but really the concept is the same. So from our perspective, we are really agnostic as to who our partners are. It, we, we have a network of organizations across North America in the Jewish community, whether JCCs or federations, or, you know, more, I'm looking at my partners on the screen who I'm in regular contact with because we partner in ways, complementary ways all the time in many different avenues. And that's what's so strong about our community, that we have different levers in different communities, but really the issues are the same. And, and so we're not we're not particular. <laughs> we know that JCCs do great programming and in some communities, they're also great fundraising partners with us. It's an interesting point. I'm not sure that time's gonna allow us to, to go back and forth a lot, but on this one, I actually would love to because Winnie mentioned being agnostic about partners and that clearly works for PJ Library. But I know in some of the partnerships we've created, it really matters who's at the table, what our purpose is and what their, their strengths are. So I'm curious either, you know, Rick Daron or Eric, if you want to comment on that, about not being agnostic about partners in certain instances. No, I'll just, uh, I'll take the liberty of saying that uh, we can't paint the communities that we work in with a broad brush. There's such great diversity in who they are and the way they're structured and uh, the strengths of federations or of congregations or of JCCs. So I think the agnosticism that Winnie was talking about uh, is consistent with an approach that says we find the right partners in each community that make sense that will take us to greater success for the community. It's not always the same coalition, but the willingness of parties within each community to align their interests for some greater good is the way we achieve the things that we're in business to achieve. Tyrone, I think that that's uh, an excellent insight and it's apropos of a question I wanna ask you, Rick. Um, you know, how do you identify continental part? I was going to say continental, but you really are international now. And you have, I have, I owe you a mazel tov that you have the first reform rabbi who's now a member of Knesset in Israel. But how do you identify these continental international partners that can both serve the whole as well as be very responsive to the local? Because on the, on the bumper stickers here in Northern California, it says, you know, think globally and act locally, Rick. So how do you, how do you balance those two? 
So I love the question, Zach. And frankly, to be honest, looking around the screen, these are all partners that I am privileged to work with pretty much on a daily basis. Um, I want to say the first thing about partnership is to realize that if I am not going to have great partners, I'm going to be limited in doing anything really consequential in the world. So that notion that you know partnership is actually the way we do the work with the most power and impact is the first thing. The second thing I would say is I actually believe that you have to have a certain trust to partner. I mean, you can work with all kinds of people, but to partner, you got to have trust. And I'll just say in a particular way, since you mentioned already in the introduction, the partnership that we've created with JCCA is just so powerful. And frankly, it started with building trust with Throne Krakow. Um, I would also say that one of the things that we're able to do with that partnership is to think about the entire field of early education. I mean, it's, it's the case that we have the two largest networks of early childhood centers. If we actually partner, we could potentially change the trajectory of North American Jewry by being more smart and creative about the specific ways we make excellence and build bridges to our early childhood centers and from them. And to be honest, the whole notion of finding these multiple partners is about having a bigger vision for Jewish life. We're not just trying to be caretakers of our institutions. We got something really monumental to do, which is to strengthen the Jewish people, to make Jewish life more vibrant. And that is only gonna be done with a network of great partners like those on the screen today. When you, when you speak of speak of visionary leadership and, uh, so, uh, sorry, Zach, do you wanna jump in? I don't wanna interrupt no, you. No, no, go ahead, go ahead, David. He was talking about visionary leadership. And of course, my next question was for Daron. And you mentioned how the trust in him um, really helped to build a great partnership with JCC Association of North America. And I want to kind of bring the question to Daron. I mean, the way that I was framing it is that, you know, we know the, the sort of saying that two Jews, three opinions, and often the Jewish community is a fractious community, and it can be challenging to play together and do so peacefully and productively. And I'm wondering if you could say a word or two or three about what makes JCCs um, and the JCC movement the right partner for other dynamic organizations and philanthropies. I think through your insights, you can give many of us in our in our hometowns or our home shops uh, good a good pitch to, to go to other partners with for why, why work with us. Deva, I have tried to make a habit of telling the people across the field things that I have observed as a relative newcomer to the field that they probably know implicitly, but sometimes don't think about explicitly. We're the big platform, 170 JCCs across the continent that we're seeing a million and a half people in person every week through their doors before the pandemic started. And that is such a diverse audience representing every corner of the Jewish community and roughly a half a million of our friends and neighbors from beyond the Jewish community who choose us, choose the Jewish community as the center to do things that they could just as easily do someplace else because of the way we do it. We're the broad platform that creates an opportunity for access and collaboration with just about anybody. And the idea that we view ourselves as a town square as the place through which you can find and engage every corner of the Jewish community and every resource that the community has makes us a perfect ally, a perfect ally that fits with every puzzle piece in the community based on where it needs to be to achieve the strengths that it aspires to achieve. Uh, and again, I think that the representation of the folks on this panel, which I'm, I gotta say, I'm pinching myself a little bit to be enjoying sharing and delivering this message with all of you, uh, is emblematic of the fact that we are showcasing our ability to be a great partner. That's our terrific advantage. That, awesome. That's great. And I know. I know. Zach has a question for for Eric. Before we do, I'm actually curious, Eric, if you would respond to to what Daron said in terms of obstacles. What gets in the way of that? Where is where, where where do the egos play in, and how can we encourage people to leave the things at the side of the road that get in our way when it comes to good collaborations locally and nationally? Well, first of all, I echo uh, Rabbi Jacobs, Rick's comment about it comes down to trust. And, and I also want to echo his uh, his assessment of Daron's leadership. It's really been transformative. And, uh, and you know, I'm proud to be a, a partner and a friend to everybody on this call, but but especially to your uh, to your terrific leader, uh, Daron Krakow. Uh, look, you know, I, I think that this is actually 
harder for people on the outside looking into our world than it is for those of us inside. Uh, you know, I get, and we should all, let's all realize that the alphabet soup of Jewish life is really confusing and can be even off-putting uh, to people on the outside. Uh, if they get different mailings and different solicitations and different things. And the number one question I get, I'm curious of whether Rick and, uh, and Daron get the, the same when I'm talking to donors is, you know, why don't you all work together? Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, I've gotten, I want to carry a sign with me around that says, we are working together. We really are working together. Uh, I mean, the truth is, uh, you know, as, as was mentioned earlier, uh, even, you know, especially since, since the pandemic started, we have a, pandemic uh, coalition of all the leading, uh, all the synagogue movements, all the leading national networks, including, you know, JCCA and others, we meet weekly to coordinate, to collaborate. But even before that, uh, we have been learning how uh, how to uh, find those areas where we complement each other. Look, no organization does everything the best, right? And, and the only way we succeed is if we find the partners that complement each other on different subject matters and different you know combinations. The you know Rick spoke about the the preschool uh, area where uh, where JCCA and, and the reform movement is our logical uh, and dynamic partners. And of course, we're proud to be funders of those programs through our 146 annual campaigns and and uh, and other funds that come from the federation system. That's a perfect partnership. We partner with Network of Human Services on uh, on uh, you know, on making sure that the that human services and vocational services and poverty relief and other, so you just you find the right partners. Uh, but but frankly, we are working together dynamically and collaboratively. And and I hope it's a message we could all get out uh, to the broader community. Eric, can I live? I want to dig a little bit deeper on that answer, if I might, because uh, when last you and I saw each other, we were sharing the stage at the Haaretz conference in in Jerusalem a few years back. Uh, a conference on Israel diaspora relations. And, and there were a number of partners at that conference as well. So I wanna understand how you identify partners. We talked a little bit earlier about how it's easy for some of us bigger tent organizations to be a little agnostic on that. But um, I'm curious if you are thoughtful about a process for that, if you have kind of thoughts about the, the tent boundaries with how you identify who you wanna partner with. Well, I think Zach, it, it really comes down to uh, knowing what your own mission is um, and uh, and then identifying those partners that help you meet your mission. You know, uh, Jewish federations use different language to describe uh, how we build community, how we care about the future of the Jewish people. But but we're all in the business of building flourishing communities, communities that are healthy, that are safe, that are caring, that are welcoming and inclusive, that are educated and engaged, that are involved in our broader civil society, through community relations, government relations, and that are deeply connected to Israel and the global Jewish people. Um, and we don't do that work ourselves. Uh, we work, we partner with different uh, uh, different organizations that help us achieve those uh, those partnerships, uh, help us achieve those successes uh, in our communities. JCCs and federations are uniquely partnered together. In fact, as as was mentioned at the beginning of the of this session, we actually are literally integrated uh, together into a single organization in in dozens of communities because you know Doran used the word platform. Uh, you're a, plat a large platform that reaches many aspects of Jewish life, and we are a large platform uh, that is, you know, raising funds and mobilizing community around the major issues of the day. So we're, it's logical that we partner together uh, on uh, on a regular uh, on a regular basis. But as we go through each of the important areas of our work, safety, uh, health, uh, you know, the the, the the needs, the chesed needs, the caring needs. Uh, of our communities, making sure that everyone has a place in our communities. We're going to partner with each, not only the organizations on this screen, uh, but with other of the other fine national networks. Uh, and remember, federation campaigns, our annual campaigns, which reach close to a billion dollars a year, collectively are the largest single sources of funds for Hillel's, for day schools, for camps, for um, you know, for JCs, for for other uh, organizations. So. Uh, birthright trips, et cetera. So the, the collective footprint of the Jewish Federation system is profound. Um, and we are, we view ourselves in service to each and every one of the organizations on this screen and our other national partners. 
So helpful. Thank you. Uh, again, sort of continuing on, the, continuing on the same track, I want to throw this one to, to Winnie and to Eric, both of you who are really deeply rooted in the philanthropic space, either um, both be, you know, in, in Winnie's case, because they are um, they're themselves a philanthropy. Um, and, and, and Eric, obviously, you're bringing together so many who are raising and distributing funds. And I'm curious to go back to Zach's earlier point about the, the, the Z3 partnership. And there's like the slapping on logos version. Then there's deep transformative partnerships. When you're encouraging organizations to, to lean in and work together because there's efficiency there, um, there's, there's, a, there's a deepening of community impact. Um, how do you assess when a partnership seems like it runs deep, when it adds value, when it matters, uh, and when it's just a slapping of logos on? I know it may not be, I'm just, I'm just curious in your conversations amongst, um, in your own organizations or amongst other philanthropists, how you think that folks are assessing that? Please, go first. I guess it comes down to mission, right? If you're mission aligned and you're talking about a project that you both have, um, you know, a, an equal share in or a, a, a shared vision around and, and by working together and adding what you can each bring to it, you can bring it further. You are a partnership. If you are just slapping your logo on something, you are not a partnership. Let's just, you are, um, it's lip service, as, which I, I think is your point, that there mm -hmm. are partnerships where it just makes sense. So um, we have had situations where we've been uh, in partnership with an organization and it was clear that actually we weren't the right partners for one another. And so we have changed. Um, but, it, but it comes again from going back to what you're trying to accomplish what you both bring to the table, whether it's expertise, whether it's dollars, whether it's um, scope and breadth and connection, and, and you know, you know when it's right, you know when it um, will move each organization further. Uh, Super helpful, thank you. Eric, yes, love yeah, your so thoughts. I, I, agree, I agree with everything that, that when he said, I'll add that you know, great partnerships are, uh, uh, are win-wins, they enable two plus two to equal 10. Uh, you know, a, a great example that many are familiar with is how we all work together uh, around the government support, the famous PPP uh, loans uh, last spring. We have the government affairs expertise, uh, you know, to work with the government to make sure that it uh, that it included the nonprofit sector. Uh, you know, we have experts that can help figure out how to apply for these funds. But you, uh, Rick, you, uh, Daron, had the trust and the network and the reach to be able to get that information out to people so that together we were able to mobilize the entire community around a major package of, uh, of relief. We couldn't have done that uh, alone, but you couldn't have done that uh, you know, alone either. And, and so when it really does, two plus two equals, uh, you know, equals 10, you, you know it. By the way, I do want to just uh, be uh, put in one uh, slightly uh, uh, provocative note to say that when you see programs with lots of logos on it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's just, uh, you know, that it's just the slapping you know, mm -hmm. of a logo. It may mean, uh, and I hope increasingly, that we've decided to let somebody else take a lead on something, but we want to show support. Uh, so, for example, we organized the global Yom Ha'atzmaut online celebration uh, each of the last two years. Um, and uh, for the first time, you saw, you know, uh, Jewish federations and JNF and the Israel American Council and JCCA and Hillel and everybody else. And there were logos all over the place. Um, and, you know, some contributed more than others to it. But by everybody joining together in a single Yom Ha'atzmaut ceremony, it said something. Back to Zach's part, you know, uh, you know, a point about where we met previously and the, and the great conference you hold on Z3. Um, and so there are moments when we, when we endorse and support uh, what each other does because we want to show that it that it has the support of the community um, and that we stand with the reform movement or we stand with the JCC movement or with the Grinspoon Foundation in an important project. We love that. By the way, don't misunderstand. I, I think, Eric, we, we're like the NASCAR of the Jewish community. The more logos you can slap on us, the better, right? <laughs> <laughs> we're all about partnerships and collaborations and working together. We um, guard, look, I'm sure it's true of you too. We guard very jealously, very carefully where we put our name because we know that it associates us with certain things. Um, and so we do it to to say that this is something important in the community that we may not be the lead on, but we want to we want to be part of. 
It's also a great reminder that some partnerships are transformative and right. some are um, some are a show of support, that it's not necessarily that one is better or worse, but it's worth knowing what kind of a partnership you're entering right. into so you know what you what you need to bring to it and you know what you expect to receive. Right, exactly. So, so Rick, if I could turn to you on that point and ask if you could share a story of how uh, one of your partnerships has been transformative and how it's taken the URJ or a specific synagogue to the next level. I know that you are so good with um, with telling stories and I hope you have one for us now. Uh, well, I, I'll try to dig in and pull one out. So first of all, I think it's obvious to partner with people who are like you and have some really obvious common areas like everyone here. I actually think the real transformative partnerships are the ones that are a really big reach. Uh, an organization or a group of people that you actually don't have a lot of commonality, but because something happens, and I'm gonna give you a specific. Uh, here in New York City, uh, we have had an unbelievable plague of uh, anti-Semitic attacks, particularly on the ultra-Orthodox community. So people would say, well, of course, the ultra-Orthodox community is uh, up in arms and, and raising its voice together. But we actually had a beautiful march. It was organized by our um, federation here in New York City. And I'm standing there with, with basically Haredi leaders, uh, modern Orthodox leaders saying, friends, this is not about having to agree with every single thing that we all do. This is seeing a bigger collective. And I think that for us, honestly, you know, the head of Chabad reached out and said, you know, could you think about working with us in this area? And I would love to stretch all of us, all of those who are listening, who are those partnerships that frankly would really take us um, out of our comfort zone, but may be the most important way to model for our community that we are actually in this together. I love that, Rick. And I have to say, I want to just follow up on this and, and redirect to, to you, Daron, because uh, I know you were just in conversation with Yehuda Kurtzer, and we have this conversation a lot about kind of the boundaries of community and, and how do you reach outside of your comfort zone, as Rick uh, instructs us to and advises us to, um, especially when it's now looking at issues maybe outside of what is to our parochial Jewish community interests. Maybe it's about racial justice. Maybe it's about social justice. Sometimes we have to think about how do we partner with these other organizations and groups doing really important work. Um, so, Daron, how do you think about that in your position? Look, I think that uh, we have to start with a certain mindset that we're engaged with an initiative or with purpose that is larger than ourselves. I think we all have a tendency to think about the ways we measure our success in the terms of what we do. So in the Federation world, sometimes it's about campaign. Uh, and in the summer camp world, it's about enrollment. And uh, in other worlds, it's about the number of grants that are provided. We each, and certainly in the JCC movement, we have our businesses and we have our measures. But I actually uh, will uh, reference our colleague, uh, Jeremy Fingerman, another wonderful partner of all of the organizations that are represented on this panel, who talks about us all being engaged in Jewish Inc., Jewish Incorporated. We are all contributing partners in an attempt to make the Jewish community a greater version of itself. And uh, while we're not always in precise alignment, there's far more that binds us together and unites these efforts than there are that divides us. And I think that has applications, Zach, to the wider community uh, in reference to your question. We are members of the communities in which we live and operate, the geographies that we support and serve, which are filled with diverse peers and partners and not always partners in the community, but as members of our societies, whether in Canada or in the United States, the issues that are confronting us as a wider community concern us as a Jewish community. And if we've exercised the muscles of partnership and collaboration, if we have exercised the effort to recognize the things that we share in common as being preeminent when it comes to issues like this, then it's easy for us to extend a hand in the direction of those that have maybe not previously been our partners, but again, with whom we share a great deal in common. Partnership, I think, is a, it requires the use of certain muscles that require exercise so that when the time comes, we've got muscle memory that we can draw upon and it allows us to be effective in those roles. Thanks, I love Tara. that. Um, switching gears a little bit, because I want to get to Winnie to tell a little bit about um, what they're doing at Grinspoon. I know that folks know you for um, the, the generosity of the foundation, but you know, you're also very deeply involved in philanthropic programs that sustain the community and benefit all partners. And I'd love you to tell us a bit about the vision behind that and what you're up to. Well, thank you. Um, 
So among the programs we run is a program called Life and Legacy, which is interesting when we, when we talk about partnership. Um, again, this is one of those ideas that everybody that, that, that applies to everybody across your across the Jewish community, right? Are you thinking about um, planning for the future and asking your supporters to consider leaving legacy gifts in their state plan for the organizations within the Jewish community that they care about? Again, it's something we all care about no matter where in North America we reside. Um, so the program Life and Legacy actually does that in every community that adopts it. Um, and then the community itself decides who, it, it welcomes every or Jewish organization in the community to participate. So um, the idea is somebody else's idea. We happily share the, the idea that came from uh, the Jewish community in San Diego. And every time we talk about life, life and legacy, we share that it was not our idea. Um, we hired somebody from that community to help expand it and take it national. And that's, again, where, uh, where a great idea comes locally and we have the capacity to expand it, it's good for everybody. Um, but what, what happens is, uh, every organization in a community, whether it's the Hebrew Home, whether it's the JCC, whether it's you know the day school, it doesn't matter whether it's the Chabad Synagogue or it's the Reform Synagogue. Again, it doesn't matter to us. We're all community. Every one of those organizations who wants to participate and is willing to put in whatever is required, which is usually manpower and time and energy and effort, um, can participate. And then... Um, a person on a team from, let's say, one of Rick's synagogues goes to meet with a family and says, well, you consider a gift to the Jewish community in Nashville, if Nashville is a community, and then hands the person a list of all the Jewish organizations in that community to choose from. So, so we don't have to worry that Rick's synagogue is going to get to that funder before the next person. And there's no, there's no fighting and there's no, um, you know, there's no siloing. So that's the kind of program that we're really proud to be part of. It, it has unintended consequences. You know, our, our focus is on helping organizations build for the future and prioritize uh, legacy giving endowments, et cetera. But, but an unintended and just beautiful consequence is that it brings communities together. People who never sat in a room together are coming to meetings together and planning together and celebrating each other's successes because everybody is working on behalf of everyone. Thanks, Winnie. That's a great answer. I, I, I feel like San Diego's getting a lot of play today, you know, between uh, <laughs> Betsy Everyone Lynch in the video. There. Everyone wants to move there, take take Betsy's job or Gary Jacobs' job. Um, but uh, I love to hear that they're getting the shout outs that they are. Thanks, Winnie. Uh, Eric, can I turn a similar question to you? Because you're also in the role of, of looking about uh, how to help communities philanthropically. Um, and I want to get your sense for how you build that, especially, you know, being based on the on the East Coast. And some of us on the West Coast are thinking about that. And every federation, every community is a little bit different. How are you thinking about philanthropic partners and philanthropic vision and building for the future, especially coming out of a crisis like COVID? Well, I, it was said before, I'm not sure if it was Daron or Rick or Winnie, but uh, in your premise of your question, Zach, you said, you know, every community is a little bit different. And of course, that is completely an accurate statement. But it also leaves a huge space for every community is also a lot alike, right? We do have very, we have common dreams and aspirations for our communities. We have common challenges that we face, whether it's on the health or education or engagement, uh, you know, parts of Jewish life. Uh, and of course we have terrific national partners like our friends at the Harold Grinspoon Foundation, like other uh, major uh, philanthropic foundations, also engagement and, uh, you know, and, uh, and educational institutions that operate at a continental level and even some of them at a global level. And so, for us at the central office, if you will, of the Jewish Federation system, uh, we look for opportunities to partner with other national networks and national programmatic and funders to be able to bring uh, to each of the 146 Federation communities the dynamic, new, creative approaches that these national entities are bringing. Because Winnie's a great example, uh, as they built PJ Library and went you know, went door to door of Jewish communities and Jewish federations. And she and I have talked about this many times. 
that I see part of my role is to is to greatly uh, uh, consolidate the time of that process so that we can more quickly take the innovations and disseminate them uh, to our community. So uh, I see um, I, I see what we have in common. Maybe it's because of the, the vantage point of standing on the, the balcony a little bit. Uh, and to me, uh, it looks uh, it looks like such ripe and open field for national partnerships and continental partnerships that can bring dynamism to multiple communities at one time. Uh, and uh, that is really our strategy for collaboration uh, as we go forward. I love that. I th uh, that's a great answer, Eric. Thank you. I want to direct uh, my last question to you, Rick, uh, before I turn it back to, to David to wrap things up. Um, but Rick, I feel like this whole conversation has been about partnerships. And so I want to kind of make it take it up to a meta level, if I might, and talk a little Torah with you, our, our rabbi in residence. But, it, you know, it says in the Torah a couple of times that it's not good for humans to be alone. Right. Uh, God says that to Adam and then uh, Moses, his father in law, when he's trying to take care of all the business. It's not good for, for you to do this alone. Is there something inherently sacred, Rick, something holy about working in partnership, about working across the community to engage others? That's like the ultimate softball that you have just thrown <laughs> over the oh, plate of one. Jewish life. One. So let me see if I, if I miss this ball, I lose my rabbinic title. Let me just say that. First of all, um, not only are those comments about loneliness um, resonant for us, but to truthfully say during this pandemic, who has not felt that loneliness? So, but it's not, it's more than just overcoming loneliness. The Jewish tradition believes deeply Tovim hashnayim min ha'echad. That's what it says in Ecclesiastes, which means two are always better than one. And I think in terms of collaboration, it is sacred. Chevruta. I don't study by myself. I find a study partner. Why? Because with that study partner, I'm going to see things that I never would have noticed on my own. I'm going to get to a level that, frankly, if I was just spending endless hours in the library, I would not discover. So the idea of partnership, chevruta, uh, collaboration, is fundamental to what it means to be a human being and what it means, I believe, to be Jewish leaders. So I believe deeply that we can study Torah together, but I would also say my collaboration with each of my colleagues here. I mean, I call up Winnie and say, I have this idea. Well, I had this idea, but Winnie had a better idea, or she pointed out where my idea could be stronger, and that's with Eric and Doron and, and so many others. That's how we do the work, and it is holy. And the last thing I would say, because you asked the rabbi, we learn in Pirkei Avot that when two people sit together and words of Torah flow between them, the Shekhinah, the divine presence, rests not in one of them, but between them. So it is holy. It is powerful. It transforms our community. It transforms each of us, and that, that is what we do. Amen to we that. We do holy work, and we're so lucky to do that. And 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 Rick, you just spoke about that so wonderfully. I'm gonna um, maybe the, the the next one to to Daron is less of a softball because he has to pick up from where you so beautifully left off. But you're talking to something like three thousand people in the JCC field right now, from fitness directors to preschool directors, team directors, those who deal in the arts or social responsibility. Many of us are exhausted. Many of us feel like we don't have enough resources to move forward. We want to be re-inspired in our work. We want to be reinvigorated in our work. We want to recommit to the impact we can have in the year and years ahead. So I know partnerships are not the only way, but since that is the theme of our closing plenary, I'm going to invite you to inspire us in, in the words of our teacher, Rabbi Rick Jacobs, to go find yourself a teacher, and find yourself a partner. How do we do that sort of in the same breath? And maybe in that inspiration, there are um, there there's an example or two that you've seen uh, recently or in your career that um, might be something that that plants a seed within each of us as we refresh, replenish, and go into the the weeks, months, and year ahead. David, thanks for that question, and it, it's inspiring to follow uh, wisdom and Torah from uh, such a wonderful scholar and such a treasured friend as Rick. Um, Look, I think it's a great kavod. It's a great honor. We honor ourselves when we are good partners with others. It's an extraordinary privilege to work with the benefit of the partners of others uh, who have so distinguished themselves. And I look at the people on this panel uh, this afternoon. 
I can't tell you how honored and proud and privileged I am to have found in them kindred spirits who have brought something that makes us as a JCC movement more special. And there isn't time for me to extol the virtues of so many wonderful things, but when he, we don't get to do the family engagement work that we do without the Grinspoon Foundation having opened the doors to tens of thousands of families that might otherwise be disconnected, but for PJ Library. Eric, I don't know how we make it through the pandemic and these last 14 months without the incredible graciousness and remarkable skill of the Washington team and the leadership of JFNA, who through your good offices and support enabled us to access more than $300 million of federal crisis funding relief and beyond the money, the knowledge that you are there uh, and that you have the back of our sector and all of the sectors in the movement gave us confidence and it gave us courage. Uh, and Rick, what we have managed to do over the course of this crisis year to advance our commitment to radically evolving the work of Jewish early childhood education to make it possible for tens of thousands of more families with young Jewish children, those families that we're finding through PJ and other means to find a home in Jewish early childhood education uh, is the stuff of dramatic evolution of Jewish life on this continent. We're incredibly honored. David, the answer to the question is locally, find those partners, find those mentors and teachers and friends with whom you can link elbows, with whom you can raise a glass, with whom you can take some time to think and figure out how when you contribute what you have and they add what they have, the things that become possible would never have been imagined but for that possibility. What a privilege to be a partner. What a privilege to have such partners. Uh, and if anything that uh, is gonna be left with us from this COVID period is that we were compelled to recognize that none of us are gonna make it on our own. And having now begun to work on these things together, that's what we need to keep as the resonance we take forward beyond the end of the crisis that working together allows us to do things we could never possibly do if we were left to our own devices. So I'll just take this moment to extend my thanks to my partners, to all of you from the bottom of my heart for the part you play in making greater Jewish life a real possibility on this continent. This past hour is a huge reminder that we have such power in this community, in this room, the, these the, these boxes, and all those who are in the, the broader room with us. Thank you so much. Rick, Winnie, Darone, and my partner in today's conversation, Zach. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you. A place where everyone is welcome and a community center for all. A community gathering space. When I think of JCC, I think of community. Community. Community is at the center of JCC's. It's about serving the needs of the community in whatever fashion they come. That's the driving factor behind all of the work that we do. I think of babies to bubbies. I think about my grandparents, my parents, um, myself, and my children. What comes to my mind is ruach. Fun, healthy people just gathering together. It's been a family to me, for sure. Just a warm, fuzzy feeling for me. It's, you know, it's an image that uh, my kid drew on the on the last page of our Haggadah, which is um, the planet Earth <laughs> with these stick figures uh, all the way around it holding hands. It's been a remarkable few days. I've reminded myself again and again that never in our long history have so many professionals representing so many JCCs gathered together in common purpose. Never. Though nothing can replace the experiences we have, both formal and informal, when we gather in person, this year's ProCon has opened our eyes to new possibilities, new methods, new dynamics, new opportunities, and new voices, so many new voices. We're living through an unprecedented crisis at a remarkable and challenging time. How do we manage to simultaneously contend with our broad and varied responsibilities? 
responsibilities to our past, and responsibilities to our future. The JCC movement is the largest platform for Jewish engagement in North America, welcoming more than a million Jews with open arms each week throughout the year. Whatever the future of Jewish life on this continent will look like, this movement will have a larger part to play in it than anyone. But there's more. Every JCC is also an embassy of the Jewish community to the wider geographies we call home. And the fact that another half million of our friends and neighbors from beyond the Jewish community are also welcomed with the same warmth and conviction every single week means that we have substantial responsibilities for how the wider community sees us and how we give expression to our participation in and responsibilities to those wider communities. It would be easier, I suppose, if we got to decide how things go. I imagine we'd choose to sidestep bomb threats and hurricanes, discrimination and hate, murder and massacres, and of course, pandemics. But we don't have the power to decide such things. There's an old Yiddish adage that roughly translates to Man plans and God laughs. John Lennon was reflecting on the same idea when he included the line, life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans in a song he wrote called Beautiful Boy, filled with life's wisdom for his son. We don't get to choose what happens to us, but we do get to decide what to do in response to what happens. Behold how good it is when we sit together as brothers. That's the literal translation. But the meaning is clear. Look at everything that becomes possible when we acknowledge all that we share in common while celebrating our magnificent diversity. We may have different features or skin tones. We may have different opinions and ideas. We certainly differ from one another in connection with our backgrounds and our abilities. Jewish history has been defined, as often as not, by how we have outlasted and overcome those whose narrow interpretations of worth, appearance, and belief were systematically relegated to the dustbin of history. While we, in all of our magnificent diversity, have continued a journey that has lasted 4,000 years, and counting. We, a Jewish people renowned for our own divisions and diversity, a continuum of discordant religious practices, an often destructive reluctance to come together in common cause even when facing the brink of the abyss. We have endured both prosperity and calamity in nearly every corner of the globe, and we come in every color, shape, and size. Boldly outspoken from nearly every political and ideological perspective, we argue, we debate. Consensus? I don't think so. And yet, in spite of everything, here we are enjoying what I believe to be the high point of Jewish history since the destruction of the Second Temple nearly 2,000 years ago. We are privileged to live in a moment in which the Jewish people enjoy sovereignty and self-determination in the modern and miraculous state of Israel. Here in North America, we have achieved more than our grandparents and great-grandparents who came to these shores for a better life could possibly have imagined. And yet, we scuffle in the face of our prosperity, less devoted to one another, less committed to our traditions, less accountable to our history, less ready to join hands. Jewish community centers and Jewish community camps exist in no small part to provide that place in which we can find common ground around the things we do, the programs and activities in which we choose to take part, irrespective of those things about which we may differ, even passionately so. What we share is far more important than what we don't. We are the keepers of 4,000 years of Jewish history and the stewards of a single moment, this moment, a moment on which the next 4,000 years may well depend. 
That philosophy, that approach is what we have to contribute to the wider conversation about community and inclusion. A conversation that has become more heated and increasingly divisive in recent years. What binds us together is far more significant than what sets us apart. The intricacies and aesthetic possibilities found in colorful mosaics are far more beautiful than bland and uninteresting homogeneity. Jewish community and Jewish life on this continent will unfold against the backdrop of the evolving society in which we live. JCCs must be about aspirations and not grievances. They must be about writing history, not rewriting it. They must be about our hopes and dreams for what could be, and not recriminations and regrets about what isn't. We have been demonstrating the power of community for well over a century. Over the course of the past 14 months, we have found opportunity in partnership and collaboration with both treasured friends and with stubborn competitors. We have seen that in times of crisis, we are capable of much more when we join hands and when we link elbows. Those lessons are a beacon of light in the darkness of this pandemic, and that beacon can guide us along our path to a better, brighter future for our JCCs, for the Jewish community, for all of us. The local impetus for collaboration and partnership has also found expression continentally as we embrace similar opportunities, forging ties with a host of new friends as well as with long-standing partners. These collaborations are reflected in groundbreaking initiatives with the Union for Reform Judaism, BBYO, the Institute for Jewish Spirituality, Upstart, Repair the World, and many more. We can and we must be more than simple Jewish community centers, more than a movement. We can become the center of Jewish community and a guiding light for communities of all kinds. Reach out, broaden your horizons, move past the soundbite and get to know those who look, sound, and think differently. Then find the common ground. That's where building community begins. Take a moment and consider the ways in which people might feel excluded or unwelcome and dedicate time to finding ways of making those obstacles disappear. Liv Mendelssohn, the remarkable Director of Inclusion and Accessibility at the Miles Nadal JCC in Toronto, shared with me a bit of wisdom from a rabbinic mentor of hers. If Hashem can create an infinite variety of people, we can find an infinite number of ways to include them. That's the recipe for building community. There's more to say, but not enough time to say it all. And that's good, I suppose, because it reminds us that the rest of the story remains to be written. And we, my dear friends, will write it together. Before we finish, a few important acknowledgments. There were 35 generous sponsors who enabled us to deliver this conference at no cost to our JCCs. And we look forward to expanded collaborations with each of them. We especially wish to thank the Coca-Cola Company, our conference's presenting sponsor, and Climber, Daxco, and Reach Local, our JCC Movement Moment sponsors. Thank you all very, very much. None of this, of course, would have been possible without the tireless efforts of the remarkable JCC Association staff, my incredible professional family, who along with all of you, through creativity and hard work, have continued to make community possible this past year. Our thanks also to the 125 delegation heads for adding to their already full plates by serving as quarterbacks for their JCCs in all aspects of their participation in ProCon. My thanks to our speakers, our facilitators, our technical support, and to everyone who had a hand in building, planning, and implementing the 95 unique sessions that unfolded over the course of these three remarkable days. Finally, this conference would have been an empty shell without each of you, without all of you, all 3,000 of you, who brought your passion, your experience, your insights, and your ideas 
to every hour of ProCon 2021. Thank you for making it extraordinary. Mark your calendars for ProCon 2023 when we will gather again in person in Orlando, Florida from Sunday, March 26th through Wednesday, March 29th. In the meanwhile, stay safe and stay strong. Better days are in the offing. When the pandemic hit and the lockdowns came, the JCC movement faced something we'd never faced before. Over 75 million people in New York, California, Illinois, and Connecticut ordered to stay at home. Decided to take increasingly aggressive steps to keep you and your family safe. But this was not our first time dealing with adversity. A total of three fires are currently raging, prompting over 250,000 people to flee their homes. People have been filing past the memorial to the victims all day long here and into this evening. And as always, we emerged resilient. There was a need for families to have their children in a supervised setting while they were engaged in their virtual learning. And we were able to rise to the occasion, uh, creating a program called Day at the J. And I'm not exaggerating, it saved him, just like it saved many other kids. And we didn't stop there. Lending a hand to our communities in the short term. If you are a senior who needs delivery services, we have contact information for the Jewish Community Center. Important for us to, to remain connected as community and not feel isolated in our homes. Channel 3 Eyewitness News reporter Eva Zamarist shares how the Hartford Mandel JCC, which in full disclosure I'm a member of, is using technology to keep members connected and fit. First responders or medical professionals, they can drop off their kids here at the Levi Jewish Community Center for what they're calling Operation Care Camp. So even though their buildings are closed right now during the coronavirus pandemic, the JCC's virtual programming can still help keep your family engaged and active. And helping them adapt to the new normal. Welcome back. We can't wait to welcome you back to the Mandel Jewish Community Center. We're so excited to have you guys back and we can't wait to see you on deck. My proudest JCC moment was when we had to reopen the JCC. It took everybody. I couldn't have been prouder for the obstacles that we overcame to have that moment. We've had to reimagine, recover, relaunch, reopen, restructure. In the face of this unprecedented crisis, the JCC movement has grown, changed, and met the needs of its communities. I think our staff is amazingly resilient. I think that we've learned that the JCC is not a luxury. Golda Meir said, You'll never find a better sparring partner than adversity. We've taken our greatest strengths, pivoted them, and created new strengths. It's that tried and true tikkun olam, right? We want to make the world a better place. If everybody has their shoulder to the rock and we're all pushing it in the same direction, to me, that's community.